it was an unusual race. We had a diesel-powered BMW with a bolt-on plastic wing that didn't do anything. So Jeremy was there. I attempted to show him the Grand Prix track at Silverstone. We had an argument about, and then the fog came out and Jeremy came in. And I think getting to the end, it is very early on a Wednesday morning in the south of England because myself and Ben Collins are heading that way to the Le Mans Classic. He told me to meet him at the beach. He should be here somewhere. Eurotunnel? Eurotunnel. Today's video is sponsored by Eurotunnel, and we are traveling today using Flexi Plus, which is well worth thinking about if you're planning your own trip to Le Mans, Spa, Monaco, or simply a trip to the continent. You get your own dedicated check-in, followed by access to the Flexi Plus Lounge. There, you can chill out with refreshments and properly take your time, as you can get on any train departing to France that you fancy throughout the day. There are some pretty cool cars in the car park that will be boarding the same train as us to attend the Le Mans Classic. And another big plus of using this service is that you will be the first on and off the train. So thank you to Eurotunnel for sponsoring today's video and making our trip to Le Mans an absolute breeze. Michael. So Ben, the whole point of this road trip was I wanted to take you down memory lane for a bit because what people might not realize is outside of Top Gear, you had a very legitimate racing career, the peak of which was Le Mans itself, the 24 yep. hours. So what, what do you remember from your time of racing at that circuit? Um, so many good memories there. I mean, racing is what got me into Top Gear in the first place. That was yep. my pedigree, if you like, to go, um, go and do that job. And um, I mean, the race is here. It's an amazing pilgrimage for a start. The whole adventure really begins you know, on, on getting there. Um, and uh, when I was racing for Ascari, which was my, what I was racing there in the prototypes, they had a, a supercar in development, so that was part of it. So we took, the, took their car out there with Andy Wallace and a Bentley and another driver who was in an MG. So we stormed out with these you know, road-going versions yeah. of what we were racing. Um, and it's just a super cool part of the whole cultural aspect of getting to the race and then taking part in the 24-hour. Cool. Well, we'll take a deep dive into your races and have a good chat about that once we get to Le Mans. But when it comes to you and travel, what are you into? Are you, well, do you like a road trip or do you like flying abroad? What's, what's your vibe? Yeah. I mean, I love flying. It's great. There's obviously some places you can't drive to, um, but um, France is not one of them. You know, it's right on our doorstep. Uh, I think you, you soak up so much more culture driving it, seeing it. You know, even if you go the wrong way, you, you find something you wouldn't have necessarily seen. Stop off for a coffee. Uh, I think it's a much better way to see the country. And uh, so, yeah, but particularly Le Mans, because it takes you through some of the most beautiful parts of France. Yeah. And it's just epic. Cool. Well, we're in Flexi Plus, so we'll get some snacks for the trip. And let's hit the train. I've got my eye on something. I bet you do. A drink for the journey. What, what are you doing? I was looking for fish. Right. So you mentioned that driving the Ascari was basically the peak of your career. What was that car like? It seems like one hell of a package. The Ascari was an absolute animal. It was a Lola tub originally, which had been converted with and with a V10 Judd engine. 800 that must horsepower. Have sounded unbelievable. Did you near yeah. ear defenders for that? Oh, yeah, I mean, occasionally they'd slip loose and we wouldn't hear a thing for like days. Wow. The ringing in your ears, 10,000 revs. Um, sequential. You, sequential box, um, no power steering, no servo assisted braking. Your foot would be numb after about an hour of, of stamping the brake pedal because the grip level of the downfalls are so high. And it was an open top cockpit, and I feel like sometimes people look at those and think they maybe don't create that much downforce, but you're talking oh. like. Formula One, if not more. Yeah, there's no lack of downforce. And uh, actually, the open air, I came through racing single seaters. It's exactly what that was like. That was yeah. it was basically it handled like a Formula One car. And um, the only thing against it was it was it was slightly heavier. That was the, the specification of sports car classes. 
Um, but wherever you went, I mean, it was always rock and roll. The, the amount of power surging through the wheels, when you get wheel spin and in that, with that engine, the, the revs, the needles be bouncing around, uh, pumping out this phenomenal sound. And at places like the Mont, you're on full throttle for 85% of the lap. Okay. And the rest of it is, is massive braking and then huge commitment through the chicanes. I mean, you never, there's no real slow corner at Le Mans. Well, hopefully when we go back to the circuit, some of those memories will come probably back for sure. So what's amazing about this place is you come out of what was a shopping centre and you're on the Mulsanne Street. It's yes. pissing it down. I brought the Scottish weather with me, but what is this like at 200 miles an hour? Awesome. Um, I love it. I mean, this, this particular straight, you come flying out of there, having done the S's, Dunlop Bridge, all that stuff, and then get the hammer down, basically. So 85% of this lap is full throttle. You're always trying to take the shortest distance. The critical thing is to be as late as possible on the brakes every time without locking the tyre because you haven't got the ABS to protect the tyre basically and you're running hour long stints so whatever you do to that tyre you've got to live with it throughout that hour um, to be as fast as you can. You're making me want to do things but right now before the Le Mans Classic it is just public road isn't it so you've got cars yeah. coming the other way very much two lanes and there's roundabouts that kind of take us off the actual Mulsanne Strait. Yeah. I mean, the amazing thing to think is that up until, well, relatively recently, a few decades ago, there were no chicanes on this straight, and yeah. they just kept winding the speed up, and all they were looking at in the far distance was a hump in the track with the Mulsanne kink, which they took at 250 miles an hour in the top-class cars. And Bloody um, hell. When the tyres were worn, I've seen some in-car of Derek Bell taking that corner, and the cars, you know, you run light downforce, you run low-wing configuration to go as quick as you can in the straights. The car's actually sideways. He's drifting at 250 miles an hour through that corner. So this would be us out of the first chicane, yep. heading down towards the second. Yeah. So you're just flying through the gears. And you were saying when you raced the Ascari here, it was weather like this. So you were aquaplaning down here. Yes, there were some big puddles here, actually. I mean, the Ascari Judd, with all that power, the gears really went very quickly. So it's like bang, 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 get through the gears, get the top speed going. But with the rain, you know, you've got 700 horsepower in your foot now in yep. this Charger. We had 800 horsepower, okay, bigger tires and all that. Now the weather we're in now, I mean, the whole place is wet, but it's not flooded. But the rain, it was those proper heavy droplets that was just smacking into the floor. You could actually see the drops hitting puddles in the track and kind of had to build a mental map of where they were and try and move around the straights to avoid the worst parts, but you, you can't. There were some sections that were flooded all the way across, had cars in the wall, left and right, and uh, it was a thing to try and hit them at speed because you still have to crack on and make progress. So you would be accelerating through, getting wheel spin in the early gears, and then you know in fourth and fifth, you sort of really just have to hold on. I love that this is a public road and we've just gone past a massive gravel trap. So that's the second chicane there. Yep. And then you're off just finishing the final bit of the Mulsanne. And here you definitely feel the speed. So even though it's about four lanes wide, I think these trees really give you that huge sense of speed. Yeah. You see them flicking past, you see the white line. So you're very aware at Le Mans. There's lots of stuff to hit if it goes wrong. Um, Peter Dunbreck, Mark Webber found that out in the Mercedes um, on, the, on the next straight towards Indianapolis. Yes, of when course. When the car took off because these CLR. things, are, they're so aerodynamic and obviously there was an airflow issue, it, you know, forget porpoising, the car took off at 190 miles an hour and uh, they were very fortunate. But yeah, downforce is working at its best and uh, you get, you know, to the end of this straight here, you've got this quite tight corner at Mulsanne. There's a nice little trick though, you can cut that apex and really square the corner off to really, a really good exit. Mm -hmm. There's little places here where you can use an extra bit of track, it does unsettle the car. And depending on what you're driving, it can be quicker or not. But um, this one I found, you end up skirting very, very close to that gravel. So you're talking about riding curbs, and I've heard a lot of people say that now Le Mans is just a 24 hour sprint. When you were racing, were cars of an age when it was again just a sprint? Or is that going back far enough where you did need to be careful with riding curbs and changing gear and all that kind of stuff? In the years I've done it, you come here, it's a 24 hour sprint. And um, there was a few people you know, going, oh, you know, you, you've got to be a bit careful. It's like, no, the, the only caution you take um, is these baguettes that they've started using for track limits. You run those repeatedly. Whoa, there's <laughs> a curve. Yeah, you want to <laughs> stay off that one when you're doing 200. 
even even at this speed you feel it the, the baguettes will break the gearbox yes you're sprinting you're driving as fast as you can but you do have to pick your battle in, in terms of how much abuse you want to put the car through so this is now the fastest part of the track um, back in the Ascari days it's about 220 so most cars are peaking around 200 miles an hour amazingly in the prototypes this was just a lift and turn right before you braked in the GTs you just quickly dab the brake take a bit of speed off and then blend through this and take as you make curb. it through, yeah, not oh, so much. Listen to that. You end up in the middle of the road, <laughs> hard on the brake, and you've got to get all of that done before this cambered left. And you never really use all the track to the right. And you swoop in to make the most of that oh, camber. Proper banked here. I didn't yeah. realise that. Proper banking. So it's a lot quicker than you think. That. And ironically, this last corner here, this little one, um, Arnage, quite slippery under braking. So you're, you're braking at a lower speed. You don't have the downforce quite often you see people loop it there and you certainly see the, the rear of the car gets quite skittish. Mm -hmm. I love this corner. And then you give it full send, back on the power quite hard. This is one of the slowest parts of the track before you launch in to the Porsche curve sequence, which is my favorite bit because all the corners here are connected. In a downforce car, and even in a GT, which has got downforce, the faster you go into the corner, the more grip you have because you're getting the more air over the wings. And um, so you have to have real, real commitment to think I'm going to have that grip yes. if I just chuck it in here. It is. I'll be interested to see how much further we can go because a lot of the circuit is very much a circuit and yeah. these are just the public road bits. I wonder if we'll get down the Porsche curves. Well, you've got this first right, but you can't use the track obviously because we're um, two way flow of traffic. Yes. But I do want to see you carrying some speed in here. Yeah, yeah let's like tuck it, it in. Here we go, get it right in there. Yeah. yeah. Now if you, and if you wash out from this apex early, you're done for. Take a bit of, yeah, we'll have a bit of that. Just be right into it. Middle of the road, no more. And then back to the right-hand side to really attack this left. And you can see the camber just runs out. It's quite a flat corner. Okay, so we are definitely stopping here. Again, yeah. I can't believe that you can take proper curbs on a public road. Go further, because actually you can okay. see the exit and you're going to see how fast this corner is, how close to the wall you get. And you can just get a glimpse of this short shoot before you dive into the left. And it's downhill, which means that so you've got gravity working against you. And that is the one where you, you feel, in particular GT, when the cars are on the, right on the edge, literally a kiss on the rear wing would send it sideways. So is that, that looks like it's starting to camber away from you up yes. there, is that correct? that's it. Wow. Track falls away and the wall just rushes up. You make a mistake, you're gonna be going straight into it. Really Early cool. morning, it's from sort of 5.30 in the morning, you start smelling barbecues on the back straight and uh, down this section where the camping sites are. And it's amazing, because everything just lights up and the place just never sleeps. Okay, well, sadly, we're gonna have to turn back there. Shall we get some dinner? Do it. Well, that was a nice, easy jaunt through France. How yeah. did you find driving the Dodge Charger? I love it. It's got great usable power and um, I did notice a little bit of a flare up, turn the traction control off. That was a little bit of a mistake at the toll booth. You enjoyed a toll booth, didn't you? Yeah, that, uh, the wall crept a little bit. It's a bit skittish. Yeah. It sort of creeps, creeps around a bit when it's wheel spinning. But um, no, it's good. I mean, actually, I was surprised, in fact, that we made it here with so, burning so little fuel. <laughs> when you're being fairly sensible, it doesn't use up the whole tank as quick as I thought. Yes, it's actually not as brutal as our M5. But one thing I was actually thinking, because we've been chatting so much about 24 hours, Top gear brick car. Yeah. What well, actually well, That was happened. a car. Well, firstly, we had a diesel-powered BMW with a bolt-on plastic wing that didn't do anything. But it was a 24-hour race. We did get to the end, which I thought was pretty epic. OK. Did you all share the driving? Or? Oh, well, everybody drove. Um, sharing, that, well, that's one thing. That's yeah. not the question. It wasn't equal <laughs> shares. I okay. mean, it was interesting. Some of, some of them did some practice. So Jeremy was there. I attempted to show him the Grand Prix track at Silverstone. And uh, we had an argument about pretty much every aspect of driving. Not much was going in, but I did, I did show him where the track went. Then we had James, and poor old Hammond turned up literally on race day for qualifying. His first lap in the car was qualifying. Mental. And then it was the race, and he got chucked in in the, in the middle of the night. But actually, he, he held himself up pretty well. He shunted into a Mosler, if I remember. Mosler no. shunted into him. OK, so it wasn't his fault. Fair no, enough. he he did exactly what we talked about. He came out onto the hangar straight, out of, out of maggots, and lined up on the right as you would, and then you know gradually was making his way to the left for Stowe and the Mosler trying to go underneath him and so yeah, sideswiped him, which was which was unfair. And and within a, a year or something of his jet car crash, so I did feel for him. But yeah, it was an unusual race. The track was full of tons of cars racing that that weekend. 
everybody drove, and then the fog came out and Jeremy came in. He, he was, basically no one could see anything. James May tried driving it, he put James in. James May could see basically the end of his nose, and so I then ended up driving most of the night. So they went to bed or went wherever they went. So I went round the clock, and then around breakfast time, I think I was relieved. Wow. And the boys picked it up and So you pretty on. much did sundown to sunrise. I, yeah, the dark, the dark stuff in the fog. But that is when we made up the places, because we were dead last. But yeah, they were, they, the guys did well, they did really well. I mean, it, the 24-hour races are tough. If you haven't done them before, you get sores in places you wouldn't expect, your body's rubbing around, you're knackered. And they're all doing their bits to camera and everything else on top of it, the pressure. Remember Jeremy actually got quite emotional at the end of it. Well, it was genuinely their first 24 hour, and I think getting to the end, it was still a serious endeavor. And the guys, you know, Steve, big Steve, who needed, desperately needed a belt to help his situation when he was fixing the car, <laughs> spent most of the race trying to patch the thing up and keeping it going um, and get it to the end. So, it, and it is a miracle when you get to the end of a 24 hour race without being wiped out and with the car being patched up and, and fixed. It is emotional. Well, that's all really cool to know. We do have an evening in Le Mans. Yeah. What do you fancy doing? You know, get some food, have a walk. But for you, uh, this is... Uh, right. It's all you need, really. It's uh, the book of all books. The good I, book, I like to call it. I do have, the white suit. I do have a book with me. Yeah. This book is, you know... The Man in the White Suit, The Stig, Le Mans, The Fast Lane and Me. If you have this book, you don't need any other books. There's some great chapters in there. I'd, I'd bring your attention, obviously, to the one on Le Mans and um, a few other you know, things that I've done and probably be inspirational for you. The Terror of Jeremy Clarkson's Underwear. That's covered. Yeah, that's brick car. You, you know, things like that. Good insight. OK. Uh, do you know what? After that, I think I will read it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Top man. be as exciting as coming here to drive a V10 Ascari, but this is not a bad destination for a road trip. Is it's it? epic. I mean, the great thing is when you're not racing, there's no pressure, no driver's briefings. We can yeah. just soak it all up and enjoy it. I'm thinking two aims for today. Let's find our favorite car each. Okay. And then I thought it would be nice for us to do a little gift exchange, buy each other a little gift. Brilliant. Let's have an explore. All right, Mike, I think I found my favorite car. Okay. All right. Now, to be fair, this is more my era, the Audi. Yeah. So I, I probably should have picked that. R8, But I'm nice. not going to. Okay. So I want, I want something that's just raw aggression. And you, you can't get more aggressive than this. The Peugeot in the early 90s. Unbelievable. An absolute monster. Naturally aspirated V10, three and a half liter. This is your world. I know you're the, you're the Group C guru. Yeah. More than I am, but I mean, this is basically the end of the Group C era, and I would choose this, if for no other reason than because of the noise okay. coming out of this thing. The V10s are absolutely incredible. So in terms of driving, you're absolutely NA over turbo. Yeah, just because the crispness under your foot, that, that first crack of throttle, you got instant power, there's no weight. I mean, it's not like driving a go-kart, but it is incredibly responsive, go-kart-like in that way. Let's have a look at this V10. Yep. Look at that. Yeah. And it's a really neat small package. I was looking at the silk cuts. Yeah. And that monstrous seven litre engine, yeah. you know, to deliver less power than this. And the wing, look at the rear yeah. wing on that. When you look in the cockpit, you know, that tiny steering wheel, everything about this car is basically a Formula One car with big skirts. Absolutely. You know, same power, more downforce actually, I think probably, but more weight because of the nature of the rules around sports cars. Sports cars is a bit of a tame word to use for these. Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. Absolute weapons. And it's funny you've picked this because my favorite car here is quite similar. And it's just over there. Let's go check it out. I think it's fairly obvious from your jacket where we're going next. Yes. So this is a 1991 Jaguar XJR14. So this is properly a Formula One car with bodywork. Yep. And you can actually see it. If I show you this bit here, 
the front of the car starts there. Yeah. And this is just an F1 front wing attached to the side. Yeah. So the car starts here and it's so low profile. You ever look at the other Group C cars, they've got big V12s on them. They need all this bodywork. This is just shrink wrapped around it. Designed by Ross Braun, so Mr. Ferrari. Right, he doesn't build stuff that doesn't win. No, exactly. So in there is the Ford HB V8, so what went into the Benetton. So Formula One V8 engine, manual gearbox, and I've been told by Andy Wallace, I don't know if it's true, that this car creates 10,000 pounds of downforce. So that equates to roughly four tons. Yeah. That seems Mind -blowing. insane. And then the, most of that is created by this back here. I don't think I've ever seen no. a rear wing as big as that. It's the biggest end plate in the world. A huge end plate, almost to the ground. Yeah. It's got four elements, one, two, three, four, yeah. pushing the back of the car down. Yeah. And then to add to that, this is one big Venturi, literally from the front of the car. Yeah. Starts off gradual and then lifts up into these tunnels. Hydraulic jacks. Unbelievable. So what's the output of that F1 engine? Honestly, not that much. It's like 650, okay. 700, so but it didn't matter. compared to my Peugeot. Absolutely, my Peugeot. absolutely. But this shat yeah. on your Peugeot, I'm afraid. Oh. Absolutely obliterated it, and to be fair, they developed that to become yeah. a bit quicker. But this... Cornering speed on this would have been much higher. Oh, Martin Brundle cried when he first got out of this car in a race. He could not believe how well it drove. It'd be very hard to pick between them. They're very different about their approach. But yeah, this is um, groundbreaking. It's like a stealth fighter. So this is slightly before your racing era, but I yeah. think the paddock just next door is right in your era. All right. So we've split up now to get each other a gift. The question is, what to buy this stick as a present? Who's going first? I'll go first. Okay, thanks. It's been an awesome trip down memory lane. Loved it. it. Great road trip. And I, I know you're massively passionate about your Group C cars. I am. But you do also like the new stuff. I do. And you have a man cave. I do. So I've got your little something to remember our trip by. Oh, yes. The Glickenhaus 2021. That's Stunning a, model. 1 to 18. That's one a big model as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Cave. Well, I hope you like mine as much I as I might like that. I didn't expect anything by return, but obviously I did. This very nice leather pouch here. Yeah. It's from a, a company called The Outlier Man. Have a look in there. It's a wash man. Running now, start, obviously. One thing that we haven't revealed to the audience yet is you have bought your new car. Yeah. And I thought these would be great for your first drive with your, your new whip. Driving gloves. Yeah. Le Mans colours, Le Mans 24 hour. Nice quality Gnarly. leather. Very 80s style, yeah. which would be perfect for my 90s hatch. I shall look forward to getting those on. Ben, it's been great to do this road trip with you. It's been awesome to hear all your memories and all your feedback from time racing at Le Mans. Maybe you'll be back here one day. I would plan? love to. That is 100% an ambition. And um, I can see the twinkle in your eyes. Well, you want to get your hands on some of the merchandise and we yeah. should work towards it. We'll see. All right. We'll see. Maybe one day. And with that, our quick fire road trip to France was over. Holidays can sometimes be make or break, and I'm happy to say I think we're besties now. Mike, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship.